Thank you for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, my very special guest is Peter Aurelian, and uh, Peter is the author of the Vault of Heaven series, and I'm very happy to have him on the show. Welcome, Peter. Hey, thanks for having me. Peter, uh, as we kick off every interview, I like to start by asking uh, my guests to give us a little uh, history and uh, tell us about how you became a writer. Well, you know, as far back as I can remember, even into elementary school, I was writing. It, it wasn't consistent, it, you know, every every night or every day as, as writers do as they get serious, but um, I was always kind of telling stories in my head and uh, I'd sit down to document something. Sometimes it was just sort of stream of consciousness stuff. And then um, when I think I was in sixth grade, uh, I was in a, a class with a, a bunch of kids, and I think it was called a multi-purpose class, and um, uh, it was like an extracurricular thing. And uh, one of the, the my friends, she and I um, wrote a play together. We started to write this mystery. Uh, we were both very enamored of Sherlock Holmes, and um, we we got halfway through and realized we weren't, you know, going to be able to craft a great, you know, Holmesian mystery. We ended up turning it into a melodrama, and it was a lot of fun for the kids to, to play act. Um, and so between then and uh, end of high school, it, it's the same sort of infrequency. I always had this deep-seated belief that I would do it someday. Um, it was like this um, latent need or urge or desire. And then um, and a lot of the writing I did, of course, then came out in various essays and, and English work through high school. And then after I graduated from high school, I took a, a high school trip, um, and I was in the curio shop in the uh, Oahu airport, and I picked up a copy of uh, Night Shift by Stephen King. And um, it really catalyzed my, my desire. I started that, that summer to actually really try and write stories. It was short fiction. And uh, I, I, w- I started my coursework as an English major that fall, and um, increasingly was writing. And then after I graduated, I moved to Seattle and, um, and I wrote my first novel. And uh, that's kind of the story. Peter, uh, in 40 some odd interviews that I've conducted with writers, you would not believe, or maybe you would, uh, how many people credit a Stephen King story as their uh, jumping off point. That's amazing. Uh, what was it about that first story that really kindled something in you, uh, to borrow a modern literary pun? Yeah, um, you know, sometimes I think King gets a bad rap, um, and it's not that everything he writes is is my favorite, um, but that's that can be said of every writer. Um, you know, I won't name names, but uh, one of my very, very favorite working fantasists today just put out a book that I couldn't finish. Um, and I don't, to me, it doesn't, doesn't um, degrade his value as a writer at all. Um, it just means he wrote a book that didn't resonate with me. Right. Um, but with King, uh, you know, he gets, I think sometimes, not always, I think he's earned some kudos as he's got, gone along. He's, he's got some awards that the establishment seems to, to value, and so he's taken a little bit more seriously. And some of the treatments on his films have, have um, been done, I think, in a more thoughtful way. And so... That accrues more value to his storytelling, you know, uh, ability. Um, but he has always been for me one of the very best at voice. Uh, I will read an entire Stephen King novel because it just feels so familiar. It's it's as though I'm having a conversation with a friend, so to speak. And and other writers are good at voice too, but um, Stephen King has that. I think it's the reason people gravitate to his work. Um, it's not simply because it's scary. In fact, some of his very, uh, some of my favorite work by him aren't sort of bona fide horror anyway. And um, uh, in that first collection of his that I got, there, you know, there were two or three stories. It was all really good, but two or three stories that really stuck with me. And one is a story called "The Last Rung on the Ladder." And um, I don't want to divulge it. Anybody who hasn't read that short story should go and and read it. Um, it you know, it's in a horror anthology because there's a it's actually more like a a Bradbury or um, weird tale, but it's not weird. It's it's just more poignant 
there's this moment of sort of crisis and fate between two young siblings. And, uh, you know, you get this perspective of those characters later in life and some of the, the tragedy that befalls them later. But the, it pivots around this, this moment in time in, in their adolescence or, or pre-adolescence. And um, uh, it, it was it typified for me the, the kind of uh, voice and ending, you know, uh, some people don't like the way King ends his stories. For me, there's a certain uh, it's like a sustained note, right? It's, uh, it's like a, a minor seventh where um, it doesn't exactly resolve, but it's the right sort of note to hit. And um, yeah, reading those stories just really helped me understand what uh, a compelling piece of fiction could make someone feel like. And that I said, I have to try it. So that's where it started. I, I love that analogy of the minor seventh note that just kind of sustains and, and hangs out there and leaves you with a sense of, of what else uh that that's a great analogy uh speaking of which uh you are also a musician uh tell us about how your kind of journey uh with music and and how uh that also kind of scratched the creative itch so to speak yeah it's kind of strange in um in high school you know a lot of my my friends were listening to i think what was dubbed at the time new wave and I was listening to it too, and I still like some of that that music. Um, I was also listening to some punk, um, and then and then I don't know, it was my first year in college or or sometime around there, um, there was a song by a band called Rat. Um, the title of the song is Round and Round, and I heard it on the radio, and it kind of changed my whole worldview on music. Wow! Um, it was, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a very '80s sort of rock anthem. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it it got so in my blood. I remember um, we went out one night, all, me and all my friends, and we were tooling around in, in my buddy's truck. And that's when I heard the song. And we were just coming to a place where we, we were getting out to go sort of exploring in this ravine. And I just told my friends to go without me because I didn't I wanted to finish the song that was being played on the radio. And it was a it was happenstance because typically they would not allow rock to be played on their on their radio because they were. They were very trenchant about their their musical tastes, and therefrom I went and, and picked up some other um, current rock albums that were being released by bands, and um, and, and I sort of my mind uh, expanded into rock and roll. And so I kind of came to that as a category late, if you will, as a as an enthusiast and a listener. And um, but the funny thing is, is when people see me or talk to me, they, they make the assumption I'm a metalhead. In fact, I listen to Broadway, I listen to jazz, I listen to classical, um, uh, I listen to what what began as New Age. One of my favorite composers is Chip Davis with Mannheim Steamroller. So I, my tastes are very, very broad. Um, but in fact, I also love the really heavy stuff. Not all of it, but some of it. And um, as I as I really got into rock and roll, I started auditioning for bands. I got in a band. That's actually what brought me to Seattle. Um, I've since recorded some, some things. I've been fortunate enough to tour with some, some uh, groups, some uh, metal groups that have toured internationally. So I've had, you know, I haven't had as much success there as I would love, um, but uh, I've, I have done that and it's been fantastic. And um, I just kind of live and breathe music. I spend time every morning before I start my day, before I start writing, in music discovery of, of new music just because it's kind of something that's just woven inside me um and so it was natural in my fiction for it to just express itself and it has uh, do you write music as well i do yeah i do um and i've i've got a collaborator that um we're, we're writing a, a concept album to go along with the series and it's been a slow burn on that because there have been a lot of other priorities for he and i both but um uh, I do some composition with keys. Um, uh, I do a lot of it sort of mentally, and then he and I will get together, and uh, I'll take him through the um, the progressions and the voicings and, and all of that kind of thing. When you're writing music, do you get ideas for stories, or the other way around, when you're when you're writing a scene, d does a piece of music come to you? Do, do those two things ever cross paths? They do. Um, I mean, the first thing I'll say is I don't actually write to music. Um, music for me is not a background thing. Um, it, it Music requires my attention. 
uh, when I even when I'm out and about, um, if music is going, you know, in a department store, um, it will draw my attention. Um, I'm sort of known for pulling out my cell phone and um, pulling up Shazam if I don't know the song, so that I can take an audio sample and know, you know, who who the composer is or or who the artist is. Um, and it, you know, music will definitely evince images for me. Um, usually, scenes, not like full-blown story arcs, but those can evolve from that. Um, but I don't use it during my writing sessions as inspiration. Um, uh, but the other, you know, it goes the other way. Uh, the the stories I write, often I can sort of subsequently um, draw correlations uh, or sort of soundtrack ideas from music. So there, and and the writing itself, um, and my favorite, the favorite writers that I read, um, are lyrical in nature. And I don't use that term. I think the way a lot of people do. I don't necessarily mean um, just the beauty in the line by line, because um, I don't think that's simply what lyricism means. Uh, for me, it's it's a there's a a deeper, and, and I guess ineffable quality to what lyrical writing is and um, I've been struggling trying to articulate this well even just myself but uh, writers like Ray Bradbury um, writers like Gene Wolfe for me do this there's a there's a way that the language is constructed that uh, frankly is not the way a a lyricist would construct language um, that creates voice for the character or the narrator and, um, you know, can be surprising based on, you know, how the, the parts of speech uh, fall in a particular sentence or, or paragraph or chapter um, and, uh, you know, or, or, you know, surprise. Um, and the, the writers I mentioned are, are those that I, I kind of hold in highest regard as lyrical writers. I don't mean simply beautiful, you know, beautiful language. I think that um, I think that's pretty superficial as far as lyricism goes. I agree with you. Um, and uh, I, I also have a similar experience where uh, sometimes if I'm writing and I'll get stuck, I'll pick up a, uh, a, a guitar and I, I usually keep one in my office and, and keep it tuned to a, like an open tuning and kind of a droning thing. And uh, as you get lost in some of those simple uh, melodies, sometimes things just open up from a from another place it's uh it's kind of a, a unique experience if 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 you're not so inclined um you may not understand that but it's a a wonderful experience um but tell us about that first book that you wrote you said you wrote a book right out of high school and you wrote your first novel what what happened with that it was a horror novel um because i really you know we talked about stephen king the, f- the first I, I cut my teeth on in, in, as far as real popular fiction goes with horror fiction. I mean, as a, as, a, as a really young kid, I remember reading Where the Red Fern Grows. And, of course, I read Sort of Shannara um, by Terry Brooks in junior high. But I didn't carry on with um, a lot of the genre from there. Uh, I believe I read the other Shannara books that came out directly after that. Um, but then I was going into high school, so I was becoming interested in girls, and um, I was having homework, and... I was an athlete through high school, so I always had practice after school. Um, And then as a middle teenager, I I also had a job so that I could afford to take girls out on dates. So I was, you know, I didn't find the time that maybe other kids did to to stay up on the genre or or any reading, really, other than what was required for my coursework. Um, So when I I got to the business of actually being a fiction reader, um, it was it was first with horror and um, I moved on to, to Dan Simmons and Ramsey Campbell and Clive Barker and um, a bunch of others. And uh, by the way, Dan Simmons still remains, I think, my favorite writer if, or very close to, if, if not my favorite. Um, and so it was natural for me that when I, I started to write my first novel, it was a horror novel and very much in the King tradition. Um, completed it. And, you know, I submitted it back then uh, to agents who's trying to, I mean, I, I haven't gone back and really read it. Um, I can, I know the story in my head, and I think the story still has merit. And I may someday rewrite that when I have the, the time. 
Um, but, you know, a learning exercise, of course. Um, and uh, from there, I, I uh, went on to write some other things, ended up with an agent, um, you know, and, and started to explore other genres of fiction. Now, um, in the meantime, while you're doing this, you're, you're also uh, obviously starting to pursue that path in music as well. Uh, but your degree you're, uh, in college is uh, uh, you have a master's in, uh, in creative writing. Is that right? No, close. Well, not not close. Um, I I, um, I have a, a a degree in English. Um, okay. I did what they call an honors degree, so I took some uh, additional coursework, um, and then I did what they call a writing emphasis. So I then I added some additional coursework on that gotcha. um, for writing, creative writing. Um, but it wasn't actually a master's degree. Gotcha. Did you? Um... And did you always know that I'm I'm going to uh, to be a writer, even you know with with competing uh, things pulling at your attention, that the focus was always to be a writer? No, no. It, well, yes, yes, and no. <laughs> um, it was the the maybe lack of focus is the right way to say it. Yeah. Um, I I thought I was going to be the Bo Jackson of the arts, I guess, because I um, thought that I would. Uh, be a full-time touring professional musician, um, a successful fiction writer. You know, I, my my dream. I was writing books during the day, and then performing at night and touring the world. Um, that was the sort of young idealist in me. And then in there somehow, I also thought I was going to play professional baseball. Um, so crazy, you know, no concept of reality or time uh, back then. Uh, I did get the English degree, though, to your point, um, with the idea that it would serve me as a writer, because I, I never intended to teach. And um, I, I did believe back then that just simply having a degree would help me find a, a job until the creative things could sustain me. But um, I think that's less true in today's society. I think there's more specialization. Um, and so the for a I'm sort of a vagrant from the liberal arts that was lucky enough to find a you know, a day job with a big company um, while I keep pursuing these artistic things. But that's that's kind of important to um, for a young person to uh, to kind of have that um, uh, that attitude that you know I'm I'm going to be great at all of these things uh, because if you if you didn't then you you wouldn't have pursued uh, all of them to the extent that you have. Um, would you have any advice for a younger person? And I know, looking back from a from an older vantage point, uh, you can say, "Well, you know, I was naive and I was, you know, this and that." But uh, it obviously served you well to have uh, a little bit of that uh, bravery, uh, if you will. Do, would you have any advice uh, from from a person at the at the place you are in life to a younger person just starting out? Uh, would you tell them to be more cautious, or would you tell them to to throw it to the wind and, and try and you know, swing for the fences. Yeah, I mean the latter, really. Um, I think that um, what happens is you, you when you start to make those big life decisions, um, if you if you're making them in my view the right way, you're starting to um, delimit you know things you can do. As an example, if you get married. And if you're, that marriage and that other person doesn't become a priority, um, I think it's a mistake. Um, and so, but then what that necessarily means is that that's now a time commitment and an, and an emotional commitment um, and, a, and a mental and spiritual commitment. And um, so I think early on, if, if you really have a passion for something, um, and I'm not talking about aptitude, I think there's a lot that can be... Um, learn by doing so I don't think everybody needs to be born at Shakespeare um, I think there's some natural aptitude that's necessary but I think that determination and and all of those things factor very heavily in success I would say I would say stay very very committed to it um, and be very you know sometimes love doesn't give a damn and it's going to you know take its way anyway but I think that you uh, my advice to a young person would be 
if you've identified a real sort of fundamental need in yourself and it's fiction or it's music or whatever, you go at it hard, like with, with all of your heart and for as long as you can before um, you start making decisions that are necessarily going to, you know, deserve attention um, that you'll have to begin to divide. And, um, uh, you know, that doesn't guarantee success, but um, that would, you know, uh, Joseph Campbell says, follow your bliss. And I, there's, there's, I've read some interesting articles lately where people are like that guy who does the dirty job show. He penned a, an essay recently where he kind of tries to refute that. And I think that that sort of neoclassical bullshit, um, I think that it's become fashionable to refute, you know, things that, um, you know, or virtues that, um, help give us the kind of fuel we need. And I don't mean just as artists, I mean, in, in any sort of uh, pursuit or vocation. Um, so I don't buy into that. Like, does it necessarily mean that simply because you want to be a great writer, you can or will be? No, because, you know, just in the same way that someone who's four foot one probably is not going to be a star NBA player. There are certain physical limitations. Right. Um, but, you know, barring these kinds of margin cases, um, if if you have, I think desire says a lot, and however much energy you place against that desire, um, I think you know matters a, a hell of a lot more than whatever natural aptitude you think you have. And so, yeah, I I I, I will tell my own kids the same thing. You know, if you are if you if you really want it, um, then go after it with all you have for as long as you can. And at some point, you may have to begin dividing attention to you know, buy groceries. I, uh, I completely agree. Uh, my oldest son is, uh, is in college and, uh, was inducted into the, uh, the honors college a, a couple of months ago. And we went to the induction ceremony and they had a, a, uh, a university president who, uh, gave the, the address and, and he basically told them, uh, follow your bliss, but, uh, find a really good job and become a good, uh, decent member of the community, uh, and put down solid roots, and then follow your bliss. And and I totally understand what he was saying. And uh, and of course you have to you know figure out how to pay the bills and and things like that. But it kind of killed a little piece of my soul when I was <laughs> when I was listening to him. You know. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I would tell people too to. Uh, find what you want to do and, and go after it and and yes figure out a way to pay the bills but uh you shouldn't have to compromise uh, but anyway um so you talked about you were really getting into horror uh what brought you over to fantasy well i i think that i it got in me when i read sort of shannara um that was really the first bona fide sort of fantasy as as we popularly sort of view it today that I ever read um, and so it, it didn't surprise me and I, and I read more obviously as, as years went on um, so I, and I always knew that I would uh, I would write fantasy um, so you know there, what happened is that I wrote the horror novel and I didn't land it anywhere of course the very next novel I started to write was the fantasy and um I didn't, um, at that time, really, I was still just writing for the pure love of it. And I think that's still true. I, I think there's a, the nuances change when you start to have uh, contracts and things. And uh, uh, it's not exactly the same as when you first sit down, um, you know, ready to take on the world and uh, with nothing in front of you but an open road, so to speak. Um, but, you know, it was, it wasn't. I didn't even think of it as a shift. You know, I wrote a horror book because I loved horror, still love horror, and um, wrote a fantasy book because I'd read fantasy. Um, I'd read some more of it since relocating to Seattle, and um, I just love the genre. There's a, the, the whole um, sort of second world, um, you know, adventure and heroism and honor and, and you know, s stakes that are, that are high, um, and someone to sort of cheer for when they're putting it on the line for someone else um, with, you know, not the kind of technology and 
and, you know, advanced warfare and everything we have today, all of that stuff just appealed to me, still does. And, um, and that's why I started. And when did you start this, uh, this current series that you're writing, The Vault of Heaven? I think it was around 2000 um, that I started it. And uh, I had one of those jobs at the time where um, I got, you know, some dead hours during the day. So I was able to, to get a lot of it done in a short amount of time. Um, you know, and then the, the rest of that story is um, I authored a, a, sort of a, a short collection that was put out by a press. And uh, that helped me land an agent. That agent, who will remain nameless, um, you know, I he didn't place the horror book. He didn't place the fantasy. Um, I came. I come to find out that he was doing a lot of shady things. Um, he and his soon-to-be wife in how they were conducting their business affairs um, with prospective clients. And um, between that and the fact that he wasn't really doing anything for me, I finally sort of let him go. But during those last few years, he had directed me to start writing um, thriller fiction because I also love thriller fiction. And I I pitched him on some ideas and he said, do that. And he, he, he pushed me there because he was trying to diversify his own client list because he was very heavy with fantasy and science fiction. So I shelved everything else. And then when I finally let him go, I was marketing the uh, thrillers to new agents, new prospective agents. And... Um, the agent I have now turned those down, but when he did, I, I pulled out the old fantasy and sent it to him. So at the time that he sent it to Tor, unbeknownst to me, by the way, and Tom Doherty you know, made a, a three-book offer on it, um, that manuscript was 10 years old. And while still proud of it, I had changed as a writer, and my vision had also changed for the series. So the first thing I did was send uh, a very sort of long, detailed mail to my editor saying how happy I was, but also here's what I want to do differently. And um, um, that was very sort of politely disregarded. And um, uh, we, you know, and then, and then that book was published. So then later, um, you know, at, down the road, years from there, um, um, that editor was dismissed. Um, I got a new editor. And through a number of sort of machinations, uh, uh, we put out what is called the author's edition of The Unremembered. And that actually released just about a month ago. Yeah, and I just picked up a copy of that uh, this past week and, uh, and also the audio book, and uh, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, where did the idea for that story come from? Well, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that were in that melting pot. Um, um, I won't lie in that some of some of the things began as, as simple images. Um, the idea of one of my main characters, Tawn, uh, standing um, in the light of pre-dawn waiting for the sunrise and the connection that um, I, I sort of just felt he would have with that and sort of growing that idea. Um, I, there were another you know, thing that went into it is the, uh, a creation mythos that I kind of had in my head. Um, I also had this notion of um, it with the magic systems that uh, in the same way that there's mechanical law for our world, like gravitation and magnetism and things like that, I thought, um, you know, what if magic had the same? And so I conceived of what I call a governing dynamic or a, a small set of governing dynamics for my world. Fundamentally, one of those is, is what I call resonance. And it underlies all of the um, magical systems that I've built for the series, I think, except the five, five, six, or seven now, not all of which you'll have read in the first book or two. But um, those, uh, they all sit on top of that set of principles. Uh, but different cultures, because they access that, those, those governing dynamics, differently, that's why you see different expressions of magic in the world, sometimes vastly so. And so that whole idea was another part of the melting pot. And um, once I just started to stir all that stuff up, you know, the, the book came out. And the other thing I would want to mention is I also had this very idealistic, maybe romantic idea um, that we can debate if it was a good one or not. Um, but my idea was that I had read so many of the sort of foundational fantasy books 
um, and also some of the new stuff that was going on. And I loved it all. And I had this idea. There's this notion in fantasy called gateway fiction, which is a book that introduces an un sort of an unread fan, an unread um, person who's not read fantasy to the genre. And I thought, well, you know, what if I wrote a series where I begin with a, a, a gateway novel that brings them in on a set of things that are familiar, you know, because people have seen Lord of the Rings and um, um, these kinds of sort of coming of age uh, stories and then take it where I want it to go in terms of, you know, my magic system and um, some of the other things that I think are unique about the series. I thought I thought this was a uh, an interesting notion, and that's what I that's what I've done. So the first book um, draws on a lot of the conventions of the genre, begins to turn them at the end of the book, and then book two, which is entitled Trial of Intentions and comes out later this month, um, is where it really sort of dials way up on, oh okay, the things you thought you knew uh, really are quite different, and the the tropes are are starting to be turned on their head. When you're creating a fantasy world, um, what, what are the first things that you? I, I know you talked about the the magic system and how that uh, is uh, integral to to the world. Do you, do you start there? Um, do you imagine a world and its uh, political systems, or all of these things kind of intertwined? What, when you're creating a brand new world universe, so to speak, where do you begin? Well, I mean, that's a that's an individual question um, for me and, and all writers. I mean, there's there's probably a, a subset of, of ways you approach this, um, whether it's with character first or with, um, you know, setting first or whatever. Uh, one of the first things a lot of fantasy writers do, and I'm no exception, is you draw a map. And it, it for some, it comes out of their RPG roots. Um, other times it's just to help you start to get a, a sense of the lay of the land and, and political um, structures can start to grow up as you think about kingdoms and nations and those kinds of things and, and imagine the the way that governance takes place. So, you know, silly as it may sound, uh, using a map is a good way to start conceptualizing that stuff. Um a lot of a lot of writers also start with character. You start to think about who you want to write about and what is it about them that's interesting, such that it's their story you want to tell. And uh, that was the same for me. Um, what I did, as an example, I, the character I have, his name is Tom. He's one of the main characters. Um, I so I set up, I set him up very much as uh, the conventional sort of orphan farm boy, um, and that's kind of by design I, I um, I'm trying to uh, build on that familiarity I was talking about and then um, as the story progresses you find that nothing could be further from the truth and so uh, for me I was thinking about one of the things I was thinking about is character but also as uh, as a function of okay um, we we build these stereotypes whether it's in fiction or just in real life and they they're good as a shorthand to get people kind of immediately familiar, but nobody's a stereotype, right? I mean, um, we learn this in, in uh, everything that's going on in the country now. There, people use a shorthand to, um, to, to call uh, uh, you know, certain groups or to try and put them in a, on a shelf and understand them better. But it's, you know, even as a, as a group, and certainly at the individual level, nobody's a stereotype. And so um, those kinds of ideas sort of inspired me to say, okay, well, if people think they can understand my character based on uh, conventions of the genre stereotype, I'll play with those things to deliberately violate those expectations. And, um, you know, some of my favorite writers do the same thing. I'm not, I'm not um, unique in that regard. Right. Uh, what do you um, – you talked about um... – giving people a, a gateway uh, to the genre and kind of playing off the typical tropes, uh, but then uh, bending them and turning them on their heads and then leading people where you want them to go. Uh, how do you um, how do you deal with the with the typical tropes and the typical uh, setup of a fantasy novel without being derivative? Uh, that 
that is something that I think a lot of fantasy authors struggle with, and um, you know, uh, and a lot of fantasy is is uh, is obviously derivative. Uh, you know, the the case could be made that Shannara is uh, you know a direct derivative of Lord of the Rings, and and so forth and so on. Uh, but you know, as an author, how do you take these very familiar things and things that people love, and that that's the reason they come back to fantasy is because they love these things, but without telling the same story over and over again? Yeah, the, the, I have a couple of ideas on that. Um, first, let me let me draw some analogies that are useful for me. Uh, I think I've said this before, but uh, as a musician and a, and a past, passionate sort of music lover, I remember when um, uh, Queensryche, who is a favorite band of mine, uh, Jet yeah. as, a, as a favorite vocalist, when they came out uh, as a band. And um, I hadn't heard them yet, but all, all of the buzz was, oh yeah, these guys are a maiden ripoff. Um, and, really? <laughs> and it, you know, it would have been easy to say, oh, well, okay, I don't need to read that. Or excuse me, I don't need to... Um, to listen to that because I can listen to Maiden. Why would I want to listen to a Maiden ripoff? Right. Um, of course, I later listened to to Queen's Right, and all I can surmise from all of the people who are making this claim is that Jeff Tate has a very powerful, um, classically trained, clean voice. I mean, he 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 rarely roughs the voice, um, and he's got great range. And so there's there's some similarities when you say those things out loud between him and Bruce Dick, Dickinson, right? Um, right. At a at a higher level, um, some people can will dismiss the entire genre of metal as all of a sameness and therefore easy to disregard once you listen to maybe a Judas Priest song, decide you don't like it, therefore metal is not for you. Um, and it's incredibly incredibly narrow. Um, uh, minded um, to, to, I think, to do that. As soon as I listened to Jafe, I could hear the difference. Um, and Queen Drake is a very, very different band from Iron Maiden. Um, the same thing is true for me with fantasy fiction. And uh, I, I, you know, I was in a lobby of a World Fantasy Convention, I don't know, five years ago, and uh, I just overheard a couple of, of uh, con goers standing around together and this is what 25 years after Shannara sort of Shannara was published and they're still having this same conversation of yeah that's just a ripoff and it's like you know are, are there archetypes that are the same yeah you bet there are um, but I've read both books and I don't I you know I, I can see the similarities but they, they're not the same reading experience for me and I think that what there's probably a lot of angles on this but one of them has to be character um, uh, let me let me give you here's another interesting exercise. If I say to you, "Hey, I read this really really great book. It's got a very young protagonist, you know, maybe ten to twelve or something. Young young kid. He goes away to magic school because um, uh, he's got great great aptitude. And um, there he encounters sort of a nemesis, somebody who proves kind of a foil and always kind of getting in his business. Um, and uh, you know he um, he has a ends up having a, a love interest, you, you know. And then I say, okay, tell me what book I'm talking about. Um, and I've, I've done this at conventions, and I get all kinds of different answers. And um, each of those, you know, the kinds of answers you can get are Harry Potter, uh, Name of the Wind, and those books are vastly different. And yes, they are. And they're both exceptionally successful, right, by two wonderful authors. So you can see that um, at, at the bones, things can be very much the same, but the expression of those things can be very, very different. And uh, it certainly has to do with character. You know, it can have to do with the, the, the way the magic functions or whatever. It's, I'm not saying that there aren't books that are, you know, um, uh, entirely derivative. That, that's probably true. I don't, I can't think of one right now, um, but I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't argue that that's not true. Uh, but I think that uh, I think we get in our own echo chamber a lot about this idea, um, uh, and we can get super dismissive. I was just—I won't name names—but I was just reading this morning um, some 
uh, some summaries from publishers on uh, new debut novels this year that are being extolled as, you know, the next great, uh, you know, writers in the field. And you read the summaries and you're like, oh, okay, that's The Gunslinger. I've read The Gunslinger. I don't need to read that. Um, and then you go through and you start to read some of the better uh, re reader reviews and understand what the writer's doing. You're like, oh, okay, that's not Gunslinger at all. And so uh, it's a it's an unfortunate thing. It, and it's the same damn thing we do with music, like where I started. The first question someone asks you when, when um, they say, oh, you got to hear this band. They'll say, well, who do they sound like? And, you know, right. someone gives an answer and that answer, you know, becomes the, the, the barometer by which you decide whether you're going to pursue them or not. And I just find that that's it's uh, it's just narrow. Yeah. And, and your snobbery filters start, uh, you know, uh, kicking in and, well, I, I don't like this or I, I do like that. Therefore, I'm not going to give this thing a chance because I've I've already dismissed it. Uh, that's that's a wonderful explanation, and uh, I I completely agree with you that uh, I think there's there's room enough in in all the genres for everyone's uh, you know new interpretation and, and take on uh, the the typical uh, setup and and yeah I, I totally agree with you. Uh, what about the new uh, or it's not new but uh, some of the divisions in fantasy that have uh, really sprang up. Uh, in recent uh, past, like dark fantasy, uh, you know, for folks like uh, Martin and the uh, Song of Ice and Fire and that kind of uh, um, more uh, brutal, nihilistic uh, take on fantasy. What, what do you think uh, about those uh, versus uh, the typical sword and sorcery type uh, fantasy? Do you, do you see a... Uh, a, a big uh, division in fantasy there, or do you think that, that those things are needed to keep it fresh and new? Well, I, I, what's interesting about your question is that um, nihilism has existed in fantasy fiction for a long damn time, and right. um, Grimdark uh, may be its newest expression and have its own sort of you know attribution now. Um, but the, you know, the spirit of your question, I think, for me, has more to do with um, what I'm in the mood for. And I think a lot of readers are like that. Um, uh, not all readers, of course, but I think readers, sometimes they want to read light fare. Like they don't, they don't need the, the text to challenge them. They don't need to have to work through it and uh, remember and understand. They really just need a, a, a wonderful entertainment experience, um, which is no less valid uh, for a writer or a reader um, versus something that is going to be emotionally uh, challenging to read. And so I think readers, depending on where they're at in their own life, um, may come to a book uh, with different expectations. What's a bummer here is that uh, publishers, mar you know, marketers in particular, and I get this because I'm a marketer, and, and you're always trying to find the best way to, to maximize, you know, the, the demand on a product, but um, they'll use they'll use language and monikers that um, don't service the reading experience, um, such that you see tons and tons of books marketed as epic fantasy that aren't epic fantasy, but are wonderful, fantastic books in their own right. And so, reader might buy a book and find, well, this isn't epic fantasy, um, and so they might otherwise have enjoyed that book if they came to it at a different time or in a different headspace, but they read it at a time when. They were trying to get into epic fantasy for the things that it does well. So I think that a lot of it's like what you're in the mood for. Now, if if you're talking about the homogenization or, you know, some people might might argue that it was a homogenization of the genre in the 80s. Um, I don't I just don't know that I buy that. I think there have always been writers who are working with different colors and palettes, so to speak. Um, I mean, Stephen R. Donaldson was back there and his stuff was certainly dark. Um and so right. I, I think you I think you get um, nihilistic stuff, you get heroic stuff. Um, for me though, I will say this: um, I I I love stuff that's dark and gritty, um, and I love characters, both antagonists and protagonists, who um, aren't Dudley Do Right and aren't Snidely Whiplash. And I've said this before, um, but I also want to be able to, as I stare down at the characters, know who to root for. Um, if there's if there's 
really no one to root for, then it's it, then the reading becomes a thought exercise. It becomes like um, the stuff I did in college and directed readings, and uh, that's typically not the kind of fiction experience I want. You know, and that could be my life stage. You know, someone else may be a 23 year old who's really trying to do a lot of literary criticism, and for them, um, they want to read something where, uh, you know, it, it it's nothing but challenge, and there's there's uh, you know there's no there's no hero, um, and uh, right. I, I'm glad to have flawed heroes, but I. You know, I do want to have someone who I can look at and say, "Man, he's got problems, but at least he's got some honor." You know what I mean? <laughs> I do. I know exactly what you mean, and and uh, and yes, I, I do think there are, are times and places for for all of those stories. Um, I I do like heroic fantasy. Uh, you know, I, I I'm like you. I like to look down at the page and know who I'm rooting for. Uh, at the same time, uh, very few of us in life are always the pure honorable good guy or the uh, purely evil bad guy and uh, I think it's a it's a chore it's a uh, it's an exercise to uh, be able to balance the um, the broad range of of what humanity actually is against a story that will uh, you know uh, uplift or um, you know get a across a point or, or something like that and that's the, the challenge for the writer yeah um where would you put the vault of heaven uh on that broad spectrum what if you and, and i and like you said it, it's it's horrible that we have to you know get down to subgenre and all that but uh you know where would you put uh the vault of heaven on that spectrum if, if you were describing to someone where it fits into the 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 vast uh, ness of fantasy. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> my readers, sort of, you know, what they read back to me um, varies. Uh, I've had some say that it's very much um, like Sanderson's um, Stormlight Archive stuff. Um, I've had some say it's very much like George Martin's Song uh, of Ice and Fire. Um, I don't know that I necessarily see those things. So some of this may, may be sort of reader expectation and, and reader perception. Um, I don't think it's nihilistic. Um, you know, I, I whatever grimdark means, I don't think it's it's gone all the way over to whatever grimdark is. And um, I'm not I'm not sure I understand the term grimdark. You know, other than if, unless you just you know equated 100% with nihilism, and I don't know if that that's the right attribution either. Uh, but it's also not, it's not 80s um, heroic fantasy and sword, or sword and sorcery. Um, some of the better, I think, language that resonates with me that some reviewers have used for my work um, talks about um, how human it is. And I think that um, there's some very, very dark things uh, in in the series, as an example, in book two, the trial of intentions, um, one of the things I deal with is suicide, and um, uh, I don't glorify it, and I don't show you active people actively committing suicide all the time, um, but I, I deal with it, and it's a it's a very dark topic, and and how people uh, move on or, or or not move on from suicide is a can be a painful thing. And uh, that's not one of the reviewers, very thoughtful woman who sent me the review she wrote, because I typically don't seek them out. But if they send them to me, I'll, a lot of times I'll read them. And she said, um, she says, calling this gritty would be a tragedy because it's not gritty. Um, it's dark and emotional and painful. And so there's some of that. There's a current of that in the work. Um, and, my, and, you know, I had the, the benefit of sitting recently on a panel with... Um, with people like Rothfuss and um, Robin Hobb and Steve Erickson and uh, Peter Brett and some others. And the uh, Robin, uh, Megan, is her, is Megan Lindholm is her, her real name. She said on that panel, because she's read my work, she said, your, your characters are exceedingly flawed. And so I think that there's something, I hope what I'm doing there is I'm writing about people that are very relatable because um, they're trying their damnedest, damnedest to do 
to stand up in the face of like really, really challenging odds um, and, and, you know, meet some threat, put something on the line for on behalf of others, um, even despite like many, many, many flaws. And uh, because it's epic fantasy, there's a lot of scale to that. And there's there's a lot of there's a lot of dark things about it. But I also think it's it's fairly clear who who you can root for. They're going to disappoint you and break your heart, but I think you're still going to hope they succeed. As in life, we're, we're, we're going to be disappointed. We're going to disappoint each other, uh, but, but hopefully we're, we're on the path. Uh, Trial of Intentions that you just mentioned uh, comes out this month uh, in hardback from Tor. Is, is that right? That's right, on the 26th. On the 26th. Um, do you do you know how many volumes are planned for the series? No, um, you know originally I uh, I had the first three kind of sketched out in my head because that's what Tor bought. They bought the first three, um, but I and then I have some broad strokes and then I know the ending with a lot of clarity. And I thought it was six or eight books. And the way I would say it that way, or why I would say it that way, is because I didn't. Uh, I won't. I won't protract the series. I won't keep going, um, be, even if I could. Um, uh, in fact, I'm beginning to write shorter. I think tighter, and I hope that just means I'm getting better. Uh, but it, the, however few books I can finish the series in is what it will be. So I know it's more than three because um, I've already got most of three written, and it's not done. Um, my instinct is it's it's five ish. You know, and it's not. I originally, I thought it was six or eight. I, I don't think it's that long anymore. I think it's more. Uh, it's more than four, uh, but it, it might not be as many as six. So it's not a great answer. Um, but the thing that my commitment, like to readers and to myself, is um, I'm writing it as tightly as possible. And when it's done, it's done. And I, you know, and then then I'll move on. You mentioned that uh, that your writing is becoming tighter, and you're actually writing shorter. Uh, which is a uh, an interesting thing for a fantasy writer to say when we have volumes of other series coming out in the thousands of pages. Yeah. Uh, do you? Uh, what's your opinion on on the the way some fantasy tends to to be epic in its page count? Uh, do you think that's necessary uh, without disparaging anyone or, or anyone's writing style? Um, do, do you think that uh, that shorter is better, longer is better? Do, do you think it depends on the story? Do you have an opinion? Um, I don't. I don't really care about page count. Um, if the if the story is is keeping me turning the pages, that's all I care about. And you can do that with a thousand pages, and you can do it with a hundred pages. Um, I think that I've read some backlash to long, long books, and some of it's because they think it's you know means that the writers not getting books out as frequently. Well, there's some truth to that because it takes longer to write a long book. But then if they were writing books that were half as long, you'd get them more frequently, but they'd be but you'd also read them twice as fast. So, you know, then you'd be waiting around for the next volume. Um, so no, I, I don't I don't think it's bad or good. I just think that the writers you know the contract a writer makes with the reader is to try and be as as compelling as they can page by page as possible. And so if that means that writing long is is compromising that, well, then write shorter. I've read very, very short books that seem long. So um, I, I, I don't really care about page count. I just care about if, if it's interesting to keep reading. Very well said. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for taking time on a Saturday to come on the show and chat with us about uh, about your writing. And tell everyone where they can f uh, follow you and uh, stay up to date with what you're publishing and, and where they can uh, get uh, in introduced and involved in the Vault of Heaven series. Yeah, so my website's easy. It's just my last name, uh, aurelian.com. That's spelled O R U L L I A N. Um, I'm on Twitter. Just as my name again, Peter Orulian at Peter Orulian. And the the first book that was re-released um, that was last last month. Book two comes out at the end of this month, and then um, uh, I have a short story collection that's set in the Vault of Heaven that released um, in February. 
and I have a novella that's coming out um, in a few weeks, uh, also set in the in the uh, in the series. Excuse me, it's, it's not it's not a continuous part of the story, but these things provide um, some of the context. Uh, for instance, as you're reading through the the novels, there'll be a historical event that'll get named, but I don't do a data dump on it at that moment. But later, if you come to the these other stories, you get the deeper context, and so. Or if you read those first, then you have these great aha moments when you're reading the novels because you actually know the, the deeper backstory. So I, I do this as part of what I call a transmedia experience, meaning they all accrue to a larger story experience if you read them all together, but they, they, they stand independently. So if people are, are, want to sample my work, I guess, um, you know, you can go uh, to a bookstore, you can go up on barnesandnoble.com or amazon.com and get one of these these shorter things and uh, sample the world, sample the writing, um, you know, see if you want to come to the other stuff. I love that idea of, of weaving a larger tapestry and, and giving some depth to the world. That's, that's an excellent idea. Uh, Peter, thank you for, uh, for coming on the show and, uh, I'll put links to all your stuff in the show notes. Great. Thank you so much, Hank.